Hello, my name's Barry. I'd like to welcome you back to another exciting adventure in, Gen in the book of Genesis. Today we're starting with Genesis chapter 14, which is best title as War of the Five Kings. I said War of the Five Kings, not the Five Armies. <laughs> What's that about? And what got things stirred up? Well, you'll have to find out. Plus, we'll be discussing some very interesting topics that uh, came up. Even some things you might not have known. If you thought you knew tithing, you're in for a surprise. Wait till later. And we'll be talking about Melchizedek, uh, the gentleman that Abraham meets. Uh, that's all I'm going to tell you for now, so sit back and enjoy. Uh, yes, yeah, chapter 14 probably could be called the War of the Kings. Right, the War and of the Kings. And the Kings. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, the War of the Kings. And I'm going to be saying a lot of names, but, you know, you could. Ju we're just going to go over them quickly. Okay, yeah. it came about in the days of Emerald, King of Shiner, Ariok, King of this one, this one, that one, all these kings that they made war with Bera, king of, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shina, king of Adma, and the other ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. All these came as allies to the Valley of Siddam. That is the Salt Sea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Twelve years they had served this guy, but the 13th year they rebelled. Mm -hmm. In the 14th year, um, this guy and the kings that were with him came and defeated other kings. And the Horites and their Mount Seir, as far as this place by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to another place, which is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amicalites and the Amorites who lived in this land. And the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboah and the king of Bela, that's Zoar, came out and they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Sidon yes. against these kings. There's four kings mm -hmm. against five. Now the valley of Siddam was full of tar pits <laughs> and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country. They took the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew and his possessions and departed for he was living in Sodom. Okay, now I want to just talk about some notes, okay? okay. This is the first war mentioned in the Bible. This is the first war mentioned in the Bible. The last war will be mentioned in Revelation 19. Okay. Abram was not a warrior by nature, but God gave him the victory. He had trained men at his disposal that he could use. Okay. Um, and Daniel 9, 27, even to the end, there will be war. Matthew 24, 6, you'll be hearing wars and rumors of wars. Mm -hmm. Do not be frightened. Okay. Um, Adam, and this, I haven't changed this number probably in about 10 years. But I'm going to give you the number that I found. Over there have been only six for 268 years of peace within 4,000 years that have passed. Mm. There's always been wars, even the Seven Day War. There's always wars. Oh yeah. And I'm talking about in the world. Okay, 268 mm. years of peace. That's it. It may have changed a little the number. Maybe it's 300. I don't know, mm. but I don't have that new number. There have been at least 8,000 peace treaties signed. And what do they do? Nothing. They get broken. <laughs> yeah, they do nothing. The war was between ungodly nations. However, it was God's attention when they took Lot. When it, they took Lot, who belonged to Abram, it got it, they messed with God. Mm -hmm. Okay? So Lot had been living amidst, amidst sinful people, but remained righteous. The Bible says he remained righteous. Even oh, yeah. He was living be within sinful people. Okay. The firm foundation of God stands having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Second Timothy 2.19. The Lord okay. knows his people. Okay. Second Peter 2.7 says, and if he rescued righteous lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for what we saw and heard that the righteous men, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. Oh, yeah. Okay, I think that's really good. So he was so Abram had sympathy toward Lot. He was prepared for war. Listen, we must be prepared for war from, by God at all times. Yeah. 
God gives us some things to do. He says, put on the full armor of God. Yeah. What does the full armor of God? It's Jesus. You're putting on Jesus. He's your salvation, the helmet of salvation. He's yep. your righteousness, the breast of righteousness. Yep. He's our sword, you know, he's our shield of faith, the author and finish of our faith. He's the belt of truth, the way, the truth, and the life. He's the, the, he our the, gospel. the press, right? The preparation of the gospel of peace. He's our peace. He's the gospel. We we talked about that already. The beginning was the word, the word was God, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, you know. And and lastly, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Yep. God, why would God tell us to wear this full armor of God? He says, because you're battling against things in the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. Twice he says in that chapter, God does not make mistakes. He knows we're going to be attacked. He knows there's going to be warfare against us. And he's trying to show us how we can be protected. And I want to tell you, the armor has no back to it. Because we're not ever supposed to run away from the enemy. No. We don't run away from the enemy. No. We no. face him. We face him and we go. We have to be offensive toward him. Because mm -hmm. we don't want to wait for him to attack us. We want to be on the front lines. And you know how we attack the enemy? Through prayer. Mm -hmm. Through prayer. There's many different types of prayers. And I'm not going to teach Ooh. on that today. Yeah. But there's many different types of truth. But this is what God says. You are, you are going to be in a battle. Be prepared. Don't think it's not going to affect you. Don't put your head in the sand because that's what the devil wants you to do. Put your head in the sand and say, I don't believe any of this. Well, then that then he's got you already. If you don't believe that you're going to be attacked, that God gave you the armor to put on, then the devil's got you already. He's got mm -hmm. your head, you know, in the sand. Yeah. All right. So I just want to tell you, there's always, okay. Uh, here's Matthew 3. I'm going to read a few verses. Matthew 3, 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make way, ready the way of the Lord. Yep. And the slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with this will and received many lashes. That's Luke 12. 2 Timothy 2, 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, they will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Um, he did evil because he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. Second Chronicles 12, 14, second Chronicles 27. So Jotham became mighty because he ordered his ways before the Lord, his God. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are, these things are really important that we know that we're going to be involved in war, but we've got to be ready to do the battle. Be mm -hmm. ready. Know your word. How did Jesus battle Satan? You shall not use this word against me. You know, men shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from that. That's what he did when he came out of the wilderness. He used the word of God. That's our weapon of warfare. Okay. So we're going to go back to here. Verse 13. Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, mm. brother of Eshcol, brother of Anmer, and these were allies with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men. He had, I forget the number. I have it written down somewhere, but there was a lot of trained men. I that think he there had. were like 300 maybe? Yes, about 300, yeah. something like that, 317. Okay, you're right. Okay, so, uh, oh, right here, it says it, duh, uh, in the house, 318. They went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants defeated them and pursued them. And they were doing this at night? Ooh. Yeah. I said he Talk about risky and dangerous. <laughs> well, you know what? When we do warfare, there's strategy. I love that. Like, I don't know if you like watching war movies, but I learned so much prayer strategy from war movies. Because you've got the helicopters above or the planes, but they're called the reconnaissance. Mm -hmm. They're going out, spying out where the enemy is. And then they report back to the general, whoever is leading the army, and they set the foot soldiers out. Okay, this is where you have to go. All right. You know, and then they have the people who are trained to tell them where to go. And they have the people who are trained to use the machine guns and the artillery, you know, and the, yeah. you know, that's what war is. You've got to have a strategy. And the mm -hmm. first strategy in war is know who your enemy is. Yeah. They have to know who their enemy is. That's why I love war movies. I learned so Whoa. much from them. I basically learned combat, not through war movies, but from my days in fantasy role-playing and stuff like that. And you learn, 
because it was all fantastic. It was easy to see the spiritual connection, yeah, spiritual uh, connection. in there. So uh, it was easy to say creatively because you learn, like, pay attention to what's going on here. Don't just right. assume and be uh, prepared for surprises. And, right. and you learn. And it's funny how the Lord taught me how to be strategic. Yes. I wasn't really the strategy. There were others who were more strategic. Mm -hmm. And they had to learn. Okay, I can't do this. I need to ask and let others help me. Yeah, that was one of the things I had to learn. <laughs> yeah, right. Gee, right. who says my fantasy role playing was useless? It yeah. was actually very helpful. <laughs> Darlene and Richard, who went to your church too, who, yes, they moved. They were so strategic. I loved praying. Oh them. yeah, they I know. Knew, they were very strategic. Knew you know what they were doing. They were awesome people. Awesome people. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. All right, so verse 16, he brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. So mm -hmm. he rescued them, okay? He had his team rescue them. All right, now here's God's promise to Abram. Then after his return from the defeat of Shedderal, that guy, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet them at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Mm -hmm. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, Brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. Yep. What does the bread and wine represent? The bread, I believe, is the word of God, and the wine is the is the spirit. The blood, right? The, yep. well, that's the communion. The bread and mm -hmm. wine communion. What's oh. communion? We do that in remembrance of yeah. Christ at the cross. Okay, so here, here's where you see Jesus. Okay, and Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. Mm. A lot of people, a lot of theologians believe that Melchizedek, when he came, was Jesus. I don't know because he doesn't have a past. He doesn't have a genealogy. He doesn't have a father. He doesn't have a mother. We don't know anything about Melchizedek. No. So a lot of people, a lot of theologians believe he might have been Jesus coming in the flesh. That okay. is a uh, distinct possibility. And for those who don't know, uh, Mel Melchizedek, <laughs> sorry, I'm mangling the name, but it was what's called the king priest. And yeah. that was actually not an unusual thing in those days. And right. the king priest was the guy who reigned over a city or a region. Right. And and I know we're going to bring up the business of tithes. Just so you yeah. folks know that tithes isn't just something that originated in the Bible. It actually was an, a Near East, ancient Near Eastern cult custom yeah. where you give a tenth to the person you are square you are loyalty because you're receiving protection whatever so right. there was a reason why uh, why Abram wasn't going to give anything to the king of Sodom Sodom because he knew that was it and and both and the other guy was going to be good and I thought it was interesting he was the priest of the most high uh, <laughs> yeah that's interesting name and I never knew that until Barry we talked about this earlier. He said, "Did you know that was, um, you know, a, a mid eastern, a, an eastern, a thing?" I said, "I never heard of that before." So, like, I learned something really special today. That's, <laughs> that's really important to know. You know, that really is. Yeah. Um, I think it is anyway. Very important to know that. So here we have Melchizedek, and he comes out. He's a priest of God Most High. He comes out with the bread and wine, representing communion. Okay, the bread represents the body of Jesus that was whipped and beaten and killed yeah. on the cross, and the, the wine represents his blood for our mm -hmm. sins and our salvation. Okay, so verse 19 he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Who had to go fight fight the enemies? Abram. Abram. Who who takes the victory? God. Mm -hmm. Okay. He has delivered your enemies into your hand. Mm -hmm. See, God tells them all through this Old Testament, I go want you to go in and take the lands from the Ittites and those ites and that. I want you to have this whole land. Go in and take the lands and I will give it to you. How did he give it to them? They had to go and fight for it. Mm -hmm. They had to go battle for it first. Yeah. So sometimes God gives us promises that we have to battle for. Oh, yeah. Battle for it in different ways. Okay. Oh, yeah. All and right. God's grace and help was seen all through that battle. In yes. the night, they didn't have night guy, night goggle vision guys no, or anything flat no. or any of that stuff. <laughs> but God gave them the victory. He gets the yeah. credit. 
I love that. I love that. Um, and then the next verse, what you talked about, he gave him a tenth of all. A tenth means a tithe. Yep. Now, I, you know, I believe in tithing. I've been tithing since I'm 19 years old when I first understood it. A tithe is a tenth of your income. Okay. Yep. Now, now people argue, is it the gross or the net? I was taught you give God the first tenth before the government takes your money. So I always tithe on my gross. Mm -hmm. Other people, even pastors say, no, I only tithe on my income the, of what the net is. Whatever, whatever you feel like you, yeah. you should be doing is, is the right thing. But we do tithe. And our church, personally, our church, um, we get every, for every dollar we get in, a tenth of that goes out to another ministry. Mm. I mean, there's been years where, you know, we've given 17% of our income away to other ministries, whether it's food pantries, it's, yeah. it's people helping the homeless, you know, like, you know, Pastor Retta, they, they, um, they're starting that again in November where mm -hmm. they're going to be, they've got two places now where they're going to be taking the homeless in Fork at River and Bayville. I mean, wow. they do an incredible ministry and they need help. They need money. Well, our church doubles what we get for them. You know, mm -hmm. we're, they're getting more than normal because we believe in what they're doing, you know. Oh, yeah. So tithing is something that I believe we're called to do. The argument I get from people a lot, and I only teach on tithe maybe once a year, once every two years, because we're not, you know, we're not like like this with the, we don't even pass the basket around in our church. The basket's in the front. Mm -hmm. We believe that God said, you bring your tithes and offerings to the Lord. I'm not collecting them. You bring them. So people know now, they know they just go to the basket and put their offerings or their tithes in it, you know. But yeah. I've had people say, um, well, that was Old Testament. No, it wasn't. It, they say it was the law. This is Genesis 14. The law has not been given yet. That doesn't come till Moses gets in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this was not the law. They knew that tithing was correct, even with Cain and Abel taking their offerings to God. This was yeah. something they must have been taught by God at some point about yeah. giving your offerings and your right. tithes to God. I I would never. The first thing when I I find out we got our checks, you know, in, in our you know in in when we were working, even especially when we were working, first thing I did was write the tithe check. That was yeah. my first bill that was paid. And I could tell you um, also. As somebody who is on tight on income, uh, when you give, it's not so much that God wants the money. You're honoring Him. You're honoring. See, I don't. I'm not giving because, like, okay, the law says this. No, yeah. I'm saying, Father, I'm going to honor you That's with right. what I have and, and give it to you yes. because I appreciate what you're doing. Right. And He doesn't have to. Could He been actually blessing me even uh, when I wasn't always tithing mm -hmm. yes, god is able to help you because yes. he has helped me right to get there and let's say maybe you have trouble um i've had some pastor friends with people i knew who said look if you're just trying to get started give five out give five percent exactly. get in the habit of right. giving right and that's really what it is you're freely yeah. giving and god will uh we will will bless you in fact, yes. now, is he going to give this prosperity? No, but he does know how to prosper in the right way. What he says, if you tithe, you can come to me and I will meet all your needs. Yep. So when I, I've never, I'm 67. I have never, ever been late with a bill. I mean, one time the, the check got lost in the mail, but that doesn't count. You know, I've never been late paying my bills because... Mm -hmm. And even when we struggled, you know, there's times when you struggle. Yep. I, I still never was late paying my bills because I tithe. And I, I would say yeah. to God, I understood it. If you read if you read in Kings about King David, he says, God, everything I have is from your hands. It's all yours. I'm going to be a steward of your money. And I I worked with money. I mean, I I I. I'm not going to just go into my job, but I was, I was moving hundreds of thousands of dollars a day away around. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was signing checks and payrolls and I had a staff that worked under me. Okay. So I understood that I am taking care of my boss's money, mm -hmm. but it didn't belong to me. No. <laughs> okay. And that's how I look at tithe. Our money yep. does not belong to us. It all belongs to God. But he is so gracious to give us 100% salary and only ask for 10% back. 
you know? So I understand that. So I would say to God, well, don't forget, we got to pay the mortgage. It's your, your house, right? He told me everything <laughs> belongs to him. And I was never, ever late with the bill because yeah. God is so faithful. When we're faithful to him, he looks at our heart. When we're faithful to him, he's faithful to us. So yeah. that, that's what I just want to say about tithing. It's so important to show God your heart. Does God need our money? No, he doesn't need money. He owns the wealth on seven hills, you know, the cattle on seven hills. He doesn't need money. He could create money by just going, you know, if he wanted to. He owns all the gold and the silver. So, he, does. Uh, like, he owns it all. He's yep. just looking at our hearts. Will we trust him? Mm -hmm. we trust that's that's really the whole point. There was uh, the I'm going to trust you to provide. I'm going to trust you. Yes, God. And I'm going to have that. And right. I also trust you, Father, right. to deal with uh, the, the not-so-faithful uh, stewards right. uh, on that. Because he will deal with them in yes. his time. Right. And he actually oh. hates it. So, yes, he knows yes. what will hurt it. Hmm? Right. So I think that is really amazing about that. This is written in chapter 14. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot about tithe in the Bible, but, you know, I love teaching yeah. on tithe. People love when I teach that once a year, twice a year. They love it because they, they're they like, wow, there's so much you're teaching us. We never knew. Like, they love that study when I teach oh. on Because it. it builds faith, too. God's going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. God will take yeah. care of you, you know. And like mm -hmm. you said, that sometimes you got to start out small, trusting God. Yeah. You start out with five dollars or, or five percent or something. Yeah. You start out, trust and learn, and then let God build your faith. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so now the next verse, 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal, thong, or anything that is yours for fear you would say. I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. And he names these men. Okay, now I want to just tell you another story, which is pretty interesting. When COVID hit, we had to shut down the churches. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, you know, I told our people, please send your tithe check to the house, you know, or, or you know, the post office box, whatever. Mm -hmm. But we could have applied for a loan with the government because we're a corporation. We're incorporated. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I prayed about it and we said, but who's, who, who do we trust? Mm -hmm. The government or God? Now, this is not judging anybody else who did it. Mm -hmm. We felt that God said, do not take the loan for our, for us, our church. Yeah. Okay? And um, not that loans are wrong. So, after we said no, within three days, I got a check in the mail for like $4,000, something Whoa. like that. And it was for somebody who just won a settlement and they were tithing on it. Oh, wow. And that paid our rent for the next couple of months. Do you understand? Like God just came through because we said, we're, you told us not to do this. We're going to trust in you, God, mm -hmm. for all our finances. And we, we got more during that time than we did when we had the doors open. Mm. God's so faithful. You know, he's so faithful, God. So uh, I just want to talk a little bit about Melchizedek. There's a sevenfold type of Christ. Okay. And I mm. think this is important to say. Okay. First is the genealogy. He was without father, without mother. Okay. Without any genealogy, neither beginning or an end. We, we just hear about Melchizedek coming on the scene just like this. Okay. Yeah. But but made but he was made like a son of God. He remains a priest perpet, perpetually. Mm -hmm. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham. Okay, and blessed him with all the promises. Number two, sacrifice. Genesis 14, 18, and met Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of the God most high. Yep. Luke 14, 30 talks about the Lord's Supper. Okay. The third one is he's in an endless priesthood. Like I want to tell you, what is Jesus doing right now? He's in heaven praying yes, for he us. Yep. He's the high priest and he's praying for us. The next one, he was a king. Um, yeah. The king of Salem, priest of the most high God. God who met Abraham is returning. Okay. 
Jesus is a king. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not only a priest, but he's a king. He is King Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. so everybody agrees with that. The oh. next was that he was greater than Abraham. Um, Hebrews 7 says, now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of his choices. He put, he put, you know, he was greater than Abraham. Mm -hmm. So is Jesus. All right. He's the king of righteousness. Who mm -hmm. is your righteousness? Jesus. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and the seventh thing from Melchizedek was he was the king of peace. And it talks about Jesus being our feast. You know, Isaiah 9, 6. Peace, you know, he's going to be our peace, wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace. Okay. So we know that Jesus, he, he had, he was a type of Jesus. No yeah. Uh, and I don't know if you thought of it, but Balaam is, I think it's Hebrew for uh, peace. Yes. And here's a fun thought. If nobody uh, probably guessed. Balaam is short for Jerusalem. Jerusalem. I thought that's what you were going to say first. Yes. Ah. Right. Hmm. Absolutely right. You know, so there's so many things that point to Jesus in this chapter. Okay. He gives Abraham a blessing symbolizing Jesus. Jesus, you know, he was a prophet. Uh, Jesus was a prophet. A prophet is a person who represents God to man. Mm -hmm. Okay. A priest, one who represents man to God. Yep. And a king, one who rules men. Okay. Under God. Okay. Jesus was all these. The, he was a prophet. He was a priest. He was a king forever. Um, Whoever wins the battle gets to keep the spoils. You know, um, it's, there's so many interesting things about Melchizedek. And I have so many different notes about it, you know, but I, I think I've gone through a lot of them already. Mm -hmm. Barry, um, uh, let me see. I have Salem here called Jerusalem. Yeah, you know, I have mm -hmm. that note here. The tithe was given 400 years, you know, before the law. And we yes. talked about that. Okay. Um, in Psalm 110, we talk it, it talks about el el yon which means the most high god some think this appearance of melchizedek was christ an appearance of christ okay there's so many there's so many scriptures here about who who we are about the, the war on ungodly nations and you know the the mm -hmm. things that god says um get ready be ready you know i read those scriptures already to you we always have to be ready for war mm -hmm. whatever god tells us to do you know, mm -hmm. we have to be ready. Um, somebody was just telling me a story. I wish I could remember it. It was like one of the most amazing stories I ever heard. Mm -hmm. But it was like, are you kidding? That really happened? Oh, I know. I'll tell you the story. Somebody was um, going to a clerk, you know, like a, a cashier kind of thing. Yeah. And the Lord spoke to this person and said, I want you to prophesy to this person. He says, well, what do you want me to prophesy to? I'll let you know when you get there. So okay. he goes up to this person, the only person available, the only, the only, nobody else, you know, everybody else had lines, but this person. And the person said, he said to the person, I have a word from God for you. And she goes, really? What's the word? He said, God says you're going to be a great mother. And the girl burst out crying. She said, I'm pregnant and nobody knows it. And I have an appointment for Tuesday to have an abortion. Ooh. She called from the phone right then and there and canceled the abortion. Oh. Isn't it amazing how mm -hmm. you have to be ready in time and out of season all the time mm -hmm. for what God wants to do. A baby's life was spared, yeah. you know, because they heard from God. I just love that, that we have to be always ready and, you know, all right, God, you know, good morning. That's God. a better I'm word. Going. Actually did more than just spare a baby. Yes, you did. That mother probably was scared yes. about the whole idea. Yes. And she needed words of hope yes. or something to say, you know what? I don't because if I'm hearing this. Right. So, uh, so the, it's two life and probably some yes. more. Right. That, that. Hmm? Isn't that amazing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Amazing.